Today's video has been brought to you by Squarespace. So yeah, gas prices, crazy all around the world. So in response to that, today I'm doing a very detailed, practical guide on how to save fuel. We'll cover everything from driving techniques to different car features and accessories to car maintenance. And we'll also see why in the real world some things work and others simply don't. So sit back and relax. And if you make it to the end of this video, I guarantee that I will not only save you fuel, but also save your time and keep you safe by showing you the things that you should never do when trying to save gas. Don't ignore your check engine light. Yes, some check engine lights may have absolutely zero impact on your current car performance and current fuel economy. You may have put in bad, low quality fuel in your car at one time and maybe your engine misfired a few times and the system stored a fault code and is keeping it displayed even though your engine is currently running perfectly fine. Yes, that may be the case, but you won't know until you actually verify what the fault code means, what the check engine light is being displayed for. And nowadays, this doesn't mean an expensive trip to the mechanic. You can do this and check this yourself for basically $5 to $10. You can uh, buy a OBD Bluetooth dongle for $5 to $10 and download a free phone app that lets you connect to the dongle and verify and check your fault codes. You can then Google the fault code online and know what's actually happening with your car. If the fault code is something like a bad oxygen sensor, then every minute you continue driving with this fault code is wasting you money. The oxygen sensor, for example, measures the amount of oxygen in the exhaust stream and reports this data to the ECU. With this data, the ECU then knows the air fuel ratio at which your engine is running. And it's using this data to relay information to the injectors to tell them how much fuel the injectors should, should spray into the combustion chamber. If your oxygen sensor is feeding incorrect information to the ECU, then the ECU is feeding incorrect information to the injectors, causing them to spray the wrong amount of fuel into your engine engine, which can lead to poor running. And if uh, the issue is telling the injectors to spray too much fuel, then you're essentially wasting fuel. And not only are you wasting fuel and money, you're also potentially harming your engine because by running rich for prolonged periods of time, you're diluting your engine oil, which could eventually lead to engine damage. A fault like this, which is causing your engine to run rough and run rich, is something that you have to get fixed anyway. The more you delay the repair, the more money you're wasting. And once you find out what the fault is and where the offending sensor is located, in some cases it might be even possible to replace it yourself with basic tools and so you don't have to spend a lot of money going to a mechanic. Now, a dirty air filter can negatively impact engine performance and fuel economy by making it harder for the engine to breathe. The dirtier the air filter, the less permeable it is. The less permeable it is, the harder it is for the engine to ingest air through it. Now, this is known as pumping losses, and all engines experience pumping losses to a greater or lesser extent. But by having a dirty filter, you can dramatically increase these pumping losses, which means that a lot of the work done by the engine is actually wasted on fighting to ingest air through a dirty filter. This means that there's less energy left to actually drive the wheels. And this then forces you to work the engine harder, press the throttle harder, waste more fuel to make up for the pumping losses. It's especially important to check the air filter often if you live in a dusty or sandy part of the world. Sometimes you don't even need to change the air filter if it's still in good condition and all it needs is a bit of cleaning using compressed air. Now, engine internals are coated with and are always spinning in an environment full of engine oil. Now, thinner engine oils like 5W30 are more viscous than thicker engine oils like 10W40, for example. Now, the thicker the engine oil, the higher its resistance to fall. The higher this resistance, the more engine work is wasted on overcoming it. The more work is wasted, the worse the fuel economy. Improved fuel economy is one of the key reasons why recent cars run ultra thin oils like 0W20 or 0W30. But be careful, you cannot run these oils in any car. You can only run the thinnest engine oil that is allowed by your owner's manual under the temperatures you live in. And also fuel savings from thinner engine oils are relatively minor, so it's definitely not worth changing your oil sooner than you need to. Now deflated tires have a much higher rolling resistance than tires inflated to the proper air pressure. As a rule of thumb, for every PSI of air pressure you're missing from a tire, you're reducing fuel efficiency by 0.1%. Uh, this means that if you're missing only 5 PSI from each tire, this alone reduces your fuel efficiency by 2%. 
Also, every PSI missing from the tire increases tire wear by 10%, and these fuel efficiency and wear losses are often even more drastic on the larger and wider tires. And if it's time to replace your tires, you might want to look into running narrower tires or switching to a type of tire which offers fuel saving benefits such as Michelin Energy Saver or Goodyear Fuel Max or similar. Putting in a low grade, low quality fuel might seem like a good way to save money, but unfortunately it usually doesn't work. A low quality fuel will potentially reduce the quality and the strength of the combustion inside your engine, leading to reduced performance and economy. Low quality fuel also potentially increases the amount of carbon deposits inside your engine, which will also eventually reduce efficiency. A long term usage of low quality fuel can also lead to things like clogged injectors, and it also makes the engine more susceptible to misfires, which will immediately trip engine sensors, cause check engine lights, and can also accelerate the rate of wear and failure of things like oxygen sensors and catalytic converters. So the savings from low quality fuel are just an illusion, and it also increases the risk of larger financial losses in the long term. Now, before we go into driving techniques, a word of warning. Never perform any fuel-saving driving techniques which endanger you, the passengers in your car, and other participants in traffic. Always use common sense and never prioritize fuel savings over safety. A fuel saving of 50 cents cannot justify crashing your car and harming or killing yourself or somebody else. Now, this should all be common sense, but I'm still going to explicitly list the things you should never do when attempting to save fuel while driving. Coasting with your engine shut off, also known as FAS or forced auto stop, is probably the single most dangerous and stupidest thing you can do when attempting to save fuel. I have seen people in the comments sections and even on some YouTube videos promoting this as a fuel saving technique when conditions are right. The conditions are never right to shut off your engine when the car is still in motion. Usually the advertised scenario when this can be performed is this. You're uh, on a deserted road, there's nothing, nobody ahead of you on the road, and, the, and you see a stop sign some, let's say, 500 or 600 meters ahead, and you shut off the engine to coast to the stop sign with a temporary MPG off infinity. But guess what? Road conditions can change within a fraction of a second, and you cannot predict the future. All of a sudden, there can be a kid chasing a ball coming in front of you or a dog running in front of you or whatever. And by having the engine shut off, you are taking away your ability to react to changing rope conditions. Even if you leave the ignition on, the steering wheel will still be very hard to turn because there will be no power steering. And also because there's no engine vacuum to power the brake booster, your brakes are going to kind of suck. And the end result is that you ruin your life by trying to save, what, a half a cent. But here's the saddest part, even if you decide to ignore this warning and still do this shut off the engine, you're not actually saving any fuel. You're not even saving that half a cent because when you turn the engine back on to get going again, the injectors are going to inject extra fuel to ensure the engine starts more easily. And on top of this, manual shutting off and turning back on the engine frequently increases engine wear. Coasting with the engine completely shut off is only possible in hybrid cars which fully retain all car controls and functions while the engine is off. Otherwise, never manually shut off your engine while the car is still in motion. Now, in the beginning of the video, I mentioned Squarespace. So what is Squarespace? Well, in simplest terms, Squarespace is the quickest, easiest, and most visually appealing path to the online presence of your business. How does it work? Easy. Step one, get your custom domain. Step two, customize and build your website in minutes using award-winning ultra sleek templates. Step three, use advanced features such as member areas to monetize your content or scheduling to tell your clients when you're available and when you're not. Step four, grow your business and get insights using email campaigns and website analytics to see exactly where you are and where you want to be. And all of this using a simple, single, one-stop shop platform packed with easy and intuitive controls. Basically, Squarespace takes out all the hassle and the chore out of the online aspect of your business, allowing you to focus on what you do best. So if you're ready to supercharge your business, head over to squarespace.com and try it out for free just to see how sleek and simple it is. And once you're ready to get started, head over to squarespace.com slash D4A to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain.
this is another example of something stupid and unsafe that you should not be doing. Drafting involves driving very, very close behind a much larger vehicle in front of you to reduce the air resistance of your vehicle and thus reduce fuel consumption. Air resistance is one of the major forces acting against your vehicle as it moves. The faster you travel, the higher the air resistance. And a lot of the engine's work is being consumed to push the vehicle through the air. This is also why aerodynamic cars are more fuel efficient than cars inspired by bricks. By driving close behind a larger vehicle, you're letting the vehicle in front of you do all the work of fighting the air resistance. And this makes it easier for your vehicle to move, which reduces the amount of engine work and fuel needed to travel. That's the theory, but in real life, it doesn't work. First of all, it's unsafe because you're completely obstructing your field of vision by having a very large vehicle in front of you. This means that you cannot see what's happening on the road ahead of you and you cannot plan ahead and react on time. Also, by being very close behind a vehicle, you are dramatically reducing your braking distance and the time you have to react. So if the vehicle in front of you suddenly brakes hard, the chances of you hitting that vehicle are greatly increased. And finally, you likely won't be saving any fuel, because by constantly trying to be very close to the vehicle in front of you, you have to be on your toes all the time. And you have to adapt your speed to the speed of that vehicle very frequently, which means that you'll be using the throttle and the brakes more often than you usually would on the highway. So it not only decreases fuel efficiency, but it actually makes you tired faster. So this technique is both unsafe and ineffective. Many people believe that the engine consumes the least fuel when it's idling. This is because the RPMs are so low, so intuitively it seems that the engine consumes the least fuel in this state. However, the reality is that the engine consumes less fuel when coasting in gear than when coasting in neutral. This is because the injectors need to keep adding fuel into the engine to keep it running at idle. But when you're coasting downhill in gear, you're actually connecting the drivetrain to the engine. And in a sense, you're allowing the wheels to do the work of spinning your engine, which is why most cars consume virtually zero fuel when coasting downhill in gear. Coasting downhill in neutral can also be dangerous. And this is because when you remove the engine from the drivetrain, you're also removing the possibility to react to road hazards and avoid them by accelerating. Also, removing torque from the driven wheels essentially gives your vehicle the handling dynamics of a soapbox car. And this can make sudden direction change maneuvers very unsafe. It's pretty obvious how you should use the throttle to avoid wasting fuel. The more throttle you apply, the more fuel the engine consumes. So the less aggressive you are, the better. Apply the throttle smoothly and gradually and never apply full throttle unless it's necessary or you're overtaking. So hard and aggressive starts are obviously a no. But also, it's not a good idea to apply too little throttle and drive unreasonably slow in comparison to the traffic around you. Uh, many drivers may react to this by trying to overtake you, and this will obviously reduce the overall safety in that situation. The key to saving fuel when driving is not to be faster or slower than the traffic around you. Instead, keep up with the pace of the traffic while maintaining a reasonable distance from it and driving as smoothly as you can. The traffic around you and the road conditions around you determine your driving pace. Adapt to the pace of the traffic around you in a timely manner and as smoothly as you can by observing what's happening ahead of you and planning on time. The more you try to fight against the traffic, the more you try to find your way through it to get ahead of others, the more fuel you are going to waste. Speeding on the highway is not going to save you time. You are simply going to end up just a few vehicles ahead on the tow booth and that's, what, one or two minutes of time saved. Throttle and braking techniques go hand in hand. If you're constantly speeding and trying to get ahead of traffic, you also end up applying the brakes harder and more often. The end result will be that you're constantly shifting between being above and below the natural pace of traffic. And this means that you're wasting fuel by accelerating too hard and then you're turning the valuable momentum generated by acceleration into brake dust and heat because you didn't manage to fit through that gap in traffic that you were aiming for. By trying to outrun traffic, you are also reducing your ability to plan ahead, anticipate and adapt to the changing road conditions. If you keep pace with the traffic, you will almost never have to brake hard. And this not only saves fuel, but it also extends the life of your brake discs and pads. The final part of the driving technique triangle belongs to shifting, and it too of course is interconnected with throttle and braking. And here too, common sense is kink. Don't shift too early and don't shift too late. 
Some vehicles have shift indicators on their tachometers, which tell you when it's a good idea to shift. Also, many new vehicles have a display indicator telling you when to upshift or downshift, but don't blindly obey these indicators. Always consider the road conditions first. The vehicle doesn't know if it's going uphill or downhill. So if you're going uphill and the vehicle is telling you to upshift and it feels like the vehicle is going to start struggling if you upshift, then don't do it. Upshifting too early when going uphill will force you to apply the accelerator pedal harder to keep the vehicle moving and the end result will be wasted rather than saved fuel. Also, upshifting too early can result in engine lugging, which will damage your engine over time. Also, don't forget to downshift when you need to accelerate hard. By trying to achieve the desired speed in a gear that's too high will again force you to apply much more throttle than in a lower gear. The end result will not only be wasted fuel, but also a very noticeable lag in acceleration and possibly engine lugging. Automatic transmissions have an overall advantage when it comes to saving fuel, especially modern automatics which are quick to shift, very smart and they can choose the optimal gear at pretty much all times. It's of course possible to be very frugal with a manual transmission too, but it requires more consistency and discipline than an automatic. As we said earlier, air resistance is one of the major obstacles that your vehicle has to constantly overcome when being in motion. The faster you're going, the higher the air resistance. Now, air is everywhere around us. We obviously can't escape it. But what we can do is try to modify the way the air impacts our vehicle. In other words, we can try to improve the aerodynamic profile of our vehicle, which is going to make pushing through the air easier, which is going to reduce the amount of work needed to go through the air, which is then going to improve the fuel economy. The smoother, the more fluid and simple the shape of your vehicle, the better its aerodynamics. This means that the greatest effects and improvements are achieved by removing stuff like roof racks, bike racks, and all other similar accessories when you're not using them. If you have a pickup truck, then use a tonneau cover whenever you can. Narrow tires and smooth and flush wheels also improve aerodynamics, but obviously the gains aren't that high to justify purchasing a new set of wheels and tires. But if you already have a spare set, then it's a good idea to use them. Switching to more modern aerodynamic wipers also helps a bit. Uh, lowering your car also helps a bit, but again, not enough to justify buying lowering springs for the sake of aerodynamics alone. But if you are already considering them, then know that they do have this additional slight benefit. But also, if you now think that this will make you incredibly fuel efficient, it won't. Remember, common sense. Also, installing smaller, more aerodynamic rear view mirrors can help, but again, not enough to justify and offset the cost of the mirrors, unless you're going to keep them for many, many years and drive many, many miles. Other than this, there aren't many practical and feasible and legal things you can do to improve your aerodynamics. However, there are a few things that you can do to make aerodynamics worse. Most aftermarket rear spoilers, especially large ones, will negatively impact aerodynamics and reduce fuel economy. Uh, questionable and cheap ones also won't help with vehicle grip because they haven't been designed in a wind tunnel and are developed purely for styling purposes. Uh, car bras and bug shields also negatively impact aerodynamics, as do things like fake intake ducts and air vents. If your vehicle is equipped with a start-stop system, then obviously don't disable it. But if it isn't equipped with a start-stop system, then don't try to manually replicate it. Some people believe that shutting off the engine manually at lights will save fuel. It will not, because your engine may be injecting extra fuel every time you start it up, especially if it's not fully warmed up. Also, if your vehicle doesn't have a start-stop system, then frequent starting and stopping is going to shorten the life of the battery, the starter motor, and the engine itself. So even if you somehow manage to save a bit of fuel, you're going to incur much higher costs in the long term. And also having to manually start the engine makes it a lot more difficult to take off from traffic lights on time, which can make you a traffic hindrance. The AC compressor is run by the engine via a belt. So every time you start the AC, you're creating an additional load on the engine, which obviously reduces fuel efficiency. On the other hand, rolling down the windows negatively impacts aerodynamics and again reduces fuel efficiency. But this of course doesn't mean that you should be sweating to death and reducing your driving concentration just to save some money. As a general rule of thumb, the negative impact on aerodynamics from windows being rolled down is negligible below around 40 miles per hour. But above that, it proportionally increases with speed, which means that above around 40 miles per hour, it's better to turn on the AC than to rely on the windows. 
Another good way to save fuel is to use windshield and window covers, which is going to keep the interior of the vehicle cooler, which is going to reduce the amount of work and intensity of the AC needed to cool the vehicle down to reasonable temperatures. Weight is one of the biggest enemies of fuel efficiency. The more weight the engine has to lug around, the more work it needs to do, and the more fuel it consumes. This means that anything that you're not using uh, should be removed from the car. When you're doing mostly city driving and aren't going into far away inaccessible areas or off-roading, you can save weight by replacing your spare wheel and tire with a tire inflator and sealant kit. Switching to small, light alloy wheels can also improve fuel efficiency by reducing the amount of work needed to rotate them. Also, stuff like bike racks, roof racks, uh, and other accessories are best removed when they're not being used. Another way you can save fuel is by keeping your tank 50% full rather than completely full. This is especially noticeable on vehicles with large fuel tanks, where half a tank can be a pretty significant weight. You have probably seen devices like these online or in the car parts stores or even supermarkets. Uh, the short answer is none of them work. You're better off spending money on buying gas than buying a fuel line magnets, engine ionizers, fuel additives, or whatever. There is no magic substance you can pour into the fuel tank that is going to reduce your fuel consumption by any measurable or significant amount. This has been tested time and time again, so don't fall for it. If it was that easy to reduce fuel consumption, then all of these devices and gadgets would be part of the vehicle from the factory and everybody would be using them. So if it sounds too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. There are also devices which plug into your OPD port or other parts of your vehicle electronics and claim to improve your fuel efficiency. Almost all of these devices do just one thing. They alter the signal from the throttle pedal to the ECU and they're telling the ECU that you have pressed the throttle pedal less than you actually have. This obviously improves fuel economy by reducing performance. That's something you can do yourself with your foot. The final category of products are called MPG monitors, and they basically pick up data from your ECU and display it to you. So not just the real-time fuel consumption figure, but also throttle percentage opening, fluid temperatures, intake air temperature. Some even offer suggestions on how to alter your driving to improve fuel efficiency. Now, these may help you attain a driving discipline, but if you feel like they're distracting and they're, they're, they're taking away your concentration, then they're actually reducing your safety. In general, it's not a good idea to become obsessed with the real-time fuel consumption display and figure because this reduces the amount of time your eyes are on the road, which can reduce your focus and your safety. Also, this is just a calculated value and it's not necessarily 100% correct. Basically, learning how to save fuel is kind of like becoming fit. There's no easy shortcut. It takes dedication and discipline. An important thing to consider is the type of vehicle you're driving. If you're driving one of these or similar, then no amount of driving discipline and accessory removal and MPG monitors or, or whatever is really going to help you. Because even if you manage to reduce fuel consumption by, let's say, 15%, uh, your fuel consumption still sucks because the vehicle is giant, heavy, and has horrible efficiency. Now, uh, in a situation like this, if you want to save money, then it's a good idea to look into switching vehicles or maybe buying even a second vehicle for commuting. If you want a low fuel consumption, then look into vehicles which are small, lightweight, and have small engines. These vehicles will not be fast, they won't have a lot of equipment, they won't be incredibly comfortable, but they will get you from A to B with minimal fuel and minimal maintenance and registration costs. And let's face it, it doesn't really matter what you're using to commute, because commuting can be equally tedious and painful in a $200,000 car and in a $2,000 car. If you live in a part of the world where it makes sense to own an electric car and if it fits your lifestyle, then that's an option to consider as well. But realistically, right now at this time, hybrid cars are probably the best option that fits pretty much anyone anywhere in the world. They have the range of combustion cars, so you don't have to worry about charging stations and charging times. They're also not sensitive to climate, but at the same time, they get to drive around with the engine being completely shut off for relatively significant periods of time, which obviously noticeably improves fuel economy and reduces emissions. And there you have it. That's pretty much it when it comes to fuel saving. I hope you found the video useful and helpful. As always, thanks all for watching. I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4HF.